Well, if we look at this, Corporal Upman was most definitely doing what he was trained for. He was making maps and translations. He was doing what, and that morning when he got up, he probably didn't expect to be reassigned. So, like I said, this reassignment probably made him very, very nervous. And when God calls us to do something, we often get very nervous. But it also forces us to lean on him and look to him for strength in doing that. And as he kept reminding Captain Miller about the Germans, I had to think about, uh, recently I've been reminding the God about the Russians a lot in my life. Tomorrow morning I'm going to the Ukraine again for the sixth time, and I'm going into a city that's under constant bombardment. Um, it's right across the river from a nuclear plant that's controlled by the Russians. So I'll admit, I'm just like Corporal Upman when I keep telling God, um, yeah, remember, there's, there's problems there. I'm, I'm worried about it. So I can understand where he was coming from. But Corporal Upman was clearly not experienced for his mission. And many of us, when we're called, we're not experienced. Even though this is my sixth trip tomorrow to the Ukraine, I still feel very, very inexperienced in doing what I need to do. So in looking at that, today I want to talk about what it takes to be qualified for a mission that God calls you on, and also why a lot of people give up on that mission. Because last week in talking about finding your mission, if you find it, but you don't feel qualified or you give up, it doesn't help you at all. So what are the qualifications to be on a mission from God? And this other question is, are we ever unqualified? And I'd like to unpack today what God has been showing me on what we need to be to be qualified. The first qualification is simply to be willing. I've spent a lot of time thinking about people I know who are impacting God, using God's word and impacting the world for God. I've been trying to find similarities between their characteristics and their traits and what, what causes them to be so successful. In doing this, something caught my attention, especially with what I call the modern-day superheroes that I'm working with in the Ukraine, those who are dodging bullets and doing amazing things for God. A lot of them have some very similar traits. Most of them are either former drug and alcohol addicts, come from really rough lives, or simply uneducated. The upper-class Ukrainians often really want nothing to do with these people, simply because they consider them beneath them. Uh, several of them actually only have a sixth grade education, and yet they're pastors and leading very large groups because they're letting God use them. But why are they so effective? Do you have to have this kind of past to be effective? And as I watched them, I started seeing the characteristic that Jesus seems to look for. Matthew four eighteen through 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, where they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So do you think the qualifications Jesus was looking for is, well, do these men go to the temple regularly? Do they know their scriptures? Are they considered good moral men? I really don't think so. I think he was simply looking for someone who was willing to come when he called them. That's it. That's all he was looking for. So being willing is very important. It seems that when we have an easy life, we often find it harder to trust in God and not feel like we need him. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. People who have to depend on God tend to have a closer relationship with him than those who don't. Now, I'm not necessarily condemning, and, and I think the difference between rich can be very different. A rich person, often in my mind, is someone who depends on their wealth. Having wealth and depending on wealth can be very different, but that's another subject that we could talk about later. We're often, we need to remember that we're depending on the blood of Christ to save us from eternal damnation. 
So even if our lives haven't been rough, even if we haven't been through a lot of things, if you're a Christian, you're depending on something. You're depending on the blood of Christ. And because of that, you should have a different perspective. When we're out of our comfort zone, we depend on God instead of our skills and resources. This is something that God's been teaching me a lot. Because believe me, I've been out of my comfort zone a lot recently. But being open to that and listening and being willing to follow God and just let him teach you those things is very important. God often takes you places your resume doesn't qualify you for. And that's because you're willing. So just being willing is very important. To, uh, is one of the most important qualifications. The second qualification is expect mistakes. Uh, last I checked, we're all human. If there's any aliens here, Roswell's that way. But the rest of us, we're human and we're flawed. The devil wants us to think that our flaws disqualify us. But in reading the Bible, it's clear that God uses flawed people. Adam ate the apple and blamed Eve. That's pretty flawed. Noah got drunk and embarrassed his family. Moses couldn't speak well. He disobeyed God by hitting the rock instead of speaking to it. He was banned from the promised land. But Moses was one of those who was given was was the one who was given the Ten Commandments, and his face glowed so much he had to wear something over it because people couldn't stand to look at him. He had spent that much time with God. So God was using him, even though he was very flawed. David had all kinds of issues. He killed a man so he could have his wife. He was such a bloody man of war that God would not let him build his temple. But God also says that David was a man after his own heart. So making mistakes is most definitely part of it. Paul in the New Testament threw Christians in jail and had them killed. Surely that would disqualify him from being used. But no, God used him then, and he's still using him today. Paul wrote most of the books, more books than anyone else in the New Testament. So does this mean that sin doesn't matter? Of course not. But if we're human, we are going to make mistakes. We need to learn from our mistakes. We need to expect them. There's a quote from the movie Billy Jack that says, Mental toughness is the ability to accept that you're human and you're going to make mistakes, lots of them, all your life. But don't let your mistakes crush you and keep you from doing your very best. Using our mistakes as building blocks helps us grow stronger. And as men, we don't want to even admit that we make mistakes. But I say, embrace mistakes. Have a glorious failure. It will change how you look at things. Because when you realize that I need God to recover and grow, it will change your perspective on that. When we focus on our past faults and and our current defeats, we often defeat God's calling in our lives because our focus is on how unqualified we are. But we're not qualified on our own. We're qualified through what God has for us. I like to think of it, isn't it great who the same God that made the mountains, the oceans, the sunsets, and the beautiful things that we see, also made you, and he said, I need one of you here on this earth. I've got a purpose for you, mistakes and all. When he looked at you and called you, he's already planned for your mistakes. So you don't have to worry about that. He knows you're going to make them, and he knows that if you follow him, you will bounce back. The third qualification is be a misfit. The dictionary defines a misfit as one who is unable to adjust to one's environment or circumstances or is considered to be awkwardly different from others. I think most of us at some time have felt like we're a misfit. We're wired to be, want to be accepted. We follow trends. We have things we consider status symbols that we use to be accepted. For years, I've been fascinated with how trends start and how quickly everyone's doing it. Often it doesn't make sense or is even practical. 
Imagine telling a poor person in India that we spend extra money to buy jeans with holes in them. There's nothing wrong with some of these trends unless we're blind to how they control us, but it's very interesting how often they can control us. We often can't imagine not keeping up with what the world tells us we need to do. Now, as men, we might often think we're exempt from some of those things. But how many of us are guilty for upgrading a truck or a house just so we can look like a successful like our friends do? There's all something that I get guilty of sometimes. So does God tell us to fit in the world around us? Are we supposed to look and act like our neighbors? So let's go back to the Bible and look for examples of what he wants us to do. Noah built an ark, and it had never even rained yet. So, you think he, was, he fit in? No, he was called crazy. He was most definitely a misfit. Joshua and Caleb told the Israelites that God had given them Canaan when ten others said the giants were too big. They were laughed at. All the prophets in the Old Testament, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, they weren't very popular. Yeah, the book of Jonah, actually, on a side note, <clears throat> is why I go to the Ukraine. I saw what happens when you don't obey God's call, and I really don't want to find out if there's a whale big enough to swallow me. So I keep going back. Jesus was criticized for spending time with the down and out, the sinners, and those who didn't fit in the religious crowd. Uh, Bob Goff, in one of his books, noted that Jesus spent his whole life engaging pe the people that most of us spent our whole lives trying to avoid. That hits me pretty hard. If we continue through the Bible, the apostles were constantly attacked for not fitting in. So from what I can tell, most of the people in the Bible were not part of the popular crowd. They were criticized a lot. Again, uh, Bob Goff in his book, Love Does, says, if people are uncomfortable because of your boldness for God, you're probably on the right track. That both bothers me and encourages me. Am I so bold that people notice? If you need a fresh perspective on loving God by loving others, I'd encourage you to look up the author, Bob Goff. He's got several books. One's Love Does, and another one's Everybody Always. Um, they really have changed my perspective on some things. And they're also on audio, so if you have some windshield time, there are great books to listen to to encourage you on a different perspective. A.W. Tozer said, Christians should be the boldest people in the world, not cocky and sure of ourselves, but sure of him. He also said, to be right with God often meant to be in trouble with men. So to me, it's very clear. We need to be misfits. The world around us should notice us for our reflection of God's love, not for being like everyone else or like we often want to be as men, just a little bit better than everyone else. But we have to first realize that without God, we are nothing, and then he can use us. But God loves misfits, and he needs us as misfits to be able to share. So just to recap here, we need to be willing. When God nudges you, say yes. When God talks to you in that still, small voice, say yes. Uh, someone once said that if you are complaining about not hearing from God when, and your Bible is closed, it's like complaining you're not getting texts when your phone is turned off. And it's very true. When we're not hearing from God, we've got to open the Bible. The second one, again, is we need to expect mistakes. We need to embrace the idea that we will fail and plan on it and plan on bouncing back so the devil doesn't control us so that we can continue with our mission. And last, just don't expect to fit in. Be a misfit on a mission for God. Some of my um, favorite sayings that I've came across while studying for this is, 
God can use somebody who just came through a divorce. He can use someone who didn't get an education. He can use someone who doesn't have the experience they need. He can use somebody who isn't over their addiction. He can use somebody who doesn't know the Bible very well. He can use you. And if he decides to use you, there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. The only thing that can stop it is you. And that's when you let the other things get back in your way. The world is full of people who want to play it safe, people who have tremendous potential and never use it. But somewhere deep inside them, they know that they could do more in life, be more, have more, but only if they're willing to take a few risks. That was George Foreman that said that. And lastly, I'm going to end with Johnny Cash. Being a Christian isn't for sissies. It takes a real man to live for God. A lot more man than to live for the devil. So just to wrap up, and I know I'm a little shorter this morning, but to wrap up with this, focus first on your mission and next prepare for it. Because I honestly don't think that any of us is unqualified. Your qualifications come through accepting Christ's blood to save you and depending on that. After that, you simply need to, like I said, be willing, expect mistakes, and be willing to be a misfit. So let's close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to be a misfit for you. Thank you for showing us exactly how you want us to walk. Just pray for each one of us here as we impact the lives of those around us that we would be willing to be quiet also and listen to what you want for us. Thank you for all you do for us. I ask this in your name. Amen.